Between 2010 and 2014, AR company Magic Leap, building a competitor to Google Glass and Oculus Rift that would supposedly blend computer graphics with the real world, managed to raise more than $540 million from the likes of Google, Qualcomm, Andresine Horowitz, and others while still operating in stealth mode. To date, Magic Leap has raised a total of $3.6 billion. But it's not all been plain sailing. Sales of its Magic Leap 1 headset were not stellar. Reviews were mixed. In April, Magic Leap cut 1,000 jobs and said it was moving away from consumer plans and pivoting towards business. One month later, Roni Abovitz announced he was stepping down as CEO. The ship needed steadying. This, after all, is a market thought to be worth between $100 and $200 billion over the next five years. Enter then in July, Peggy Johnson, the former Microsoft and Qualcomm executive as Magic Leap's new CEO. In this fireside with Peggy, we'll discuss the emerging AR space and explore the direction in which the tech and Magic Leap is headed. Peggy, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much indeed. Um, let me start straight away by just asking you outright, what attracted you to, to Magic Leap? Yeah, great question, and thanks for having me. It's really great to be here with you today, Jeremy. You know, I had always been passionate about uh, the augmented reality space going back. I mean, I'm 35 years in the tech industry. Going back to my Qualcomm days, we had a product called Euphoria. Obviously, Microsoft had HoloLens. And I had been tracking the progress of Magic Leap for several years. And I just think it's amazing technology. And it, it truly is the next generation of computing. So just from a pure tech standpoint and a, a bit of geekiness, maybe, because I'm an engineer, I was very attracted to it. <laughs> Were you trying? Were you, were you were you sort of interested in seeing if you could fix what was going what was going on at Magic Leap? Because obviously there's there's such potential there. Were you interested in getting in there and and setting it straight? Well, let me first say there was nothing really broken. I think, like any early stage technology, um, you don't quite know where how things will evolve. And so when I got there, what I found was um, a fabulous team, a very diverse. Um, very high performing team. They also have probably one of the biggest patent portfolios I've ever seen in a tech company of that size. It's amazing. And the tech and the device worked very, very well. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, it was, you know, it was focused at consumer originally. And I think like a lot of tech, um, the first market really is enterprise. If you just look back at mobile phones, they, they were uh, largely bought by enterprise back in the day when they first launched. I mean, they were expensive, but they fit a need, which was, you know, particularly for instance, people traveling, working out of their cars, uh, didn't have to stop and make phone calls and, and, you know, find a phone booth and make a call. You could just do it from your car. And that was something that, uh, uh, gave a return on investment to enterprises. And I think very similar, we'll see this technology start out in the enterprise as where Magic Leap is now focused. Um, and eventually it'll reach into the consumer uh, segments over time. I see, I see. So do you think that um, the, the, because it was aimed initially at the consumers before your time at the, at the company, do you think the promise of Magic Leap was oversold in that regard then? I think they were looking at both enterprise and consumer, but were largely, you know, most of their efforts were on consumer. And it was early days, uh, for instance, in, uh, in the content world, there wasn't a lot of content yet for uh, consumers to consume. The devices are a bit large right now, admittedly. But again, those are things that enterprise can kind of take care of. There is a lot of interesting applications that enterprises are using already, uh, perhaps on a mobile phone or on a tablet that can be put onto the Magic Leap device. And it just brings a whole new um, uh, atmosphere of, it's a, it's a sort of a new canvas where you can spatially locate the content anywhere in the physical world. And this can be quite a differentiator for enterprise and, and enterprises today are finding a return on investment in these devices. So while it was perhaps a bit early stage for consumer, it's just right for enterprise. 
I guess that to, then that leads me to a question then about use cases, as you mentioned there. You know, that how do you actually pick the use cases for Magic Leap? Because it's one of these things that can go anywhere. It's something that could, that could be applied to almost anything. For example, when well, you mentioned smartphones earlier, no one asked what smartphones were for. They were so generalized, you could be used for anything. So with, with such a, with a, a, an application like Magic Leap or such a, a, a format, how do you even start? Okay, well, let's start here. Where do you choose to go? That's a great question. And since I was in the mobile phone industry back in the early days, I remember us thinking, you know, maybe, maybe someday a million of these will be sold. <laughs> and now, obviously, with all of the use cases for a mobile phone, there's something like one and a half billion sold every year. And so you're right, use cases are important. They prove out the technology, they show what's viable and, and where there is value. And we're finding the, the most active use cases right now for augmented reality are training, uh, remote, something called remote assistance where you don't have to fly an expert in, you can uh, put on the device and basically have a computer on your eyes and someone maybe a continent away can be helping you um, troubleshoot a, a machine in a factory that's down. So you don't have to always get that expert physically in front of a machine anymore. You can do quite a bit uh, remotely. And boy, it, you know, in these COVID times, there's, there's no better way to fix a machine since you can't get on an airplane uh, to so many places. I was going to ask um, about the health sector as well, actually, too. It, exactly, with telehealth as well. Yeah. Um, telehealth has definitely uh, has seen an acceleration during the pandemic. Um, there's just you know, no way to get in front of, of your medical doctor if it's you know, just something you, where you don't actually have to be in hospital. This is an easy way to sort of fit that bill. And the other one is anything that has to do with 3D visualization. So design teams right now can't get together uh, physically, but they can get together virtually and put the object they're designing, whether it's a car or shoes or whatever in the midst of them, and um, they, can, they can hold a design session much like they would in a physical meeting room. I'd be really interested, as you mentioned COVID, I'd be really interested to see what your viewpoint is on, on you know, some people have suggested that, you know, COVID-19 was almost the perfect time for AR and VR to shine, you know, this idea of remote working, remote contact, um, and it's not quite uh, been the case. So we're interested to know what your, your thoughts are on that, Peggy. Well, we are seeing use cases uh, accelerate during COVID for sure. And frankly, I think it's things, you know, I would say just a few, you know, maybe even just last year, if you ask CEOs about augmented reality, it was on their radar. Now they're seeking it out. Several um, companies have come forward and asked us, do you have solutions for us? Because we can't physically co-locate our employees and we need to, we can't, work can't just stop. So. Well, you know, I think it certainly was accelerated during COVID. I think this is really the start of an embracing of the technology, it, more, um, you know, widespread, more mainstream uh, because of the catalyst that COVID came, you know, came to be for this sort of technology. Um, and we're seeing that every day. We have incoming all the time from companies seeking solutions uh, because they can't physically be present. With um, looking to sort of maybe expanding, as you say, the, the knowledge of the AR sector and people coming to you and saying, we actually want to use this for something, but we don't quite know what for. I'm wondering if there's a, there's a pivot point in certain other, in sort of a, a consumer realization of this technology. For example, um, when Apple went into the, the smartwatch, uh, world, the arena, it almost legitimized that sector and made it a proper sector. In, you know, in, and now Apple watches are sell more than the entirety of the Swiss watch industry globally, for example. Do you think there's something like that that needs to happen for augmented reality? Do you think that you need like Apple or someone like that to come in and legitimize the AR sector? Well, it's certainly helpful to have more companies in the tech interest in the tech industry interested in the technology and we're certainly seeing that from apple and many others 
But frankly, it, you know, it was one of the reasons I even knew uh, Roni, the previous CEO. We used to get together at conferences all the time because we were both in the AR business and we wanted to see the industry develop and accelerate. So the more interest in augmented reality, I think the faster the technology will, will grow. And, um, and I think you know, companies will focus on different things. Apple's largely focused likely on consumer. Uh, which is great. It, it just brings more understanding of what this tech can do. Um, where you know, where it, literally, it's making your physical space the canvas to draw upon. You know, you can have an infinite set of screens, for instance, in front of your physical space in an augmented world. Um, so, so the more the better. And I think that you know, the the tech is legitimized already. But as more uh, tech companies come into the space that'll grow even faster. And I think it'll accelerate things. You mentioned the, the hardware earlier and the size of the hardware, for example. Um, you know, what, um, a lot of people were interested in Magic Leap 1. You know, there was a tremendous amount of goodwill towards it before it came out. And people were going like, we really want this to be superb. Um, you know, what do you think needs to be addressed uh, in, the, in the hardware that you're working on right now, then sort of the next, the next versions of it? You know, or is it, is it the software that needs to, be, needs to be addressed or is it a mixture of the two? But there's definitely work to be done and I know you're working on it right now, so what do you think? Yeah, definitely a mix of both. Um, clearly, just like mobile phones and the trajectory of mobile phones, we wanna see the device lighter. We wanna see it uh, longer wearing. Um, because if you are a frontline worker in a factory, for instance, you don't want to have it too heavy where it, you know, it feels burdensome after an hour. You want an all-day device. And yeah. so we're definitely working on that. In fact, Magic Leap did something innovative where they put a lot of the weight and the compute uh, down on um, your belts or pocket where you can take the headset and lighten it up by moving a lot of that down uh, and off of the head. Uh, and that's super helpful for enterprise, for you know, for any company needing an all-day kind of an experience. Um, but the software as well will continue to evolve. And as I mentioned, there were there are several companies that are working on just transferring their uh, tablet or PC-based software uh, that's focused on enterprise to the device and seeing great value in doing that. For instance, we've got uh, companies that. Um, are working on uh, manufacturing facilities and an employee comes in in the morning and they have a list, a checklist of things to do rather than running back to a, a PC or carrying a tablet around, they put the device on and their checklist is in front of them. If they come up to a machine, they can see the performance of the machine. Uh, they can uh, see what's, uh, if there's any red flags that have happened, if there's sensors that need to be adjusted, if they need help doing that, they can call an expert hands-free and uh, the expert can talk them through it. So it's really empowering frontline workers with a new type of experience, giving them a lot more confidence in their job and making that time to competency quite a bit shorter than uh, in the past where maybe they sat in a classroom for three weeks before uh, heading out to the factory floor. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that, I mean, obviously, I was wondering whether the, the enterprise version or going back to this enterprise version of Magic Leap would actually bring back in some of the abilities that the, the beast version of Magic Leap, the, the very large version of Magic Leap, then some of the sacrifices that had to be taken out and made for it to be made a wearable product. Are you going to be trying to bring that sort of the, some of the wow factor that was from that beast version of Magic Leap back into the enterprise version, or is it, you, is it definitely going down this route of wearable technology, walking around, you know, that sort of thing? Well, you know, some of the wow factor is here today. A, a story I want to share with you, I don't know if you'd heard, there was a conjoined twins that were conjoined at the head um, that uh, one of the universities in California, UC Davis, just successfully separated. And they used the Magic Leap device uh, to train the very large team that worked on the separation of those twins. They, uh, people could um, put the device on and see the conjoined brain where they would uh, then do the separation, walk uh, the, the, the entire team through it together. Um, they could be co-located or they could be in different parts of the world ahead of the operation. It was, it was quite an amazing thing to see uh, and to be a small part of, 
of what the miracle that happened when they were able to successfully separate those twins. But that's the sort of thing that I find amazing and, and a wow factor to have been part of uh, that journey. That's absolutely awesome. And um, let me just quickly, while we've got time, ask a couple of audience questions because we've got them coming in, if you don't mind. Right. So here we've got here, uh, which sectors do you see under leveraging the potential of AR? And why do you think that is, Peggy? Well, for certainly the health sector, as I said, I mean, that was one great example. Um, we have a number of companies that have, uh, during COVID, become much more interested, uh, met you know, healthcare companies in what the device can do. And I think uh, things like pre-surgical planning, uh, we've got uh, a company that we've been working with for a couple of years named Brain Lab that uh, can do 3D MRIs, uh, which really make uh, the patient data come to life. And I think that is a sector that we can go much more deep into and bring real value to, definitely. And Another question here I like is, how has your life experience made you the leader you are today? One of the audience members asked Peggy. And that's an interesting oh. question at the moment because we, you know, female CEOs, absolutely right on. We need more of them, of course, as you say. So give us that too, if you can. Well, you know, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer and I was 25 years at Qualcomm and six years at Microsoft, two iconic, amazing companies. Um, and I feel like that experience and, and being able to be part of, for instance, Microsoft's uh, whole cultural transformation over the last six years really put me in a good position to step into this role. And, and I sought a CEO role out. I wanted to be not just a CEO, but a tech CEO <laughs> to <laughs> leverage my background. <laughs> Excellent. OK, well, I'm going to pin you down on this very last question, Peggy. Um, as you say, you know, the idea is obviously, you know, going to enterprise, making this work, making the magically uh, product smaller, making it more usable. But with always an eye on the future that this is eventually going to have some sort of consumer use case. If I were to if I were to really pin you down and say, basically, how long do you think it will be till we will be walking around with a data overlay? on everything we see, that dream that we actually want, this sort of new world that we're looking for. What do you think? How long do you think that time frame will be? Well, you know, it'll probably be out um, several more years until we can get the type of optics that are in the device today, which are premium optics. Uh, the ability to spatially locate digital content is not easy to do. It's very different than VR. AR is something much more complex. So I think it'll be several more years before we see sort of a glasses form that can give you that same high fidelity, high performance that we're showing in our devices today. But it's coming for sure. Excellent. I'll hold you to that, Peggy. I really will. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Absolute pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you again.